What children want at this age, they want with the whole of them. They haven't learnt yet that other people have needs and wishes just as urgent as theirs. But because we humans are social animals, we want to be liked by other people and to like them in return. We want to work and play together. Our natural aggressiveness can give us drive and purpose for all sorts of activities and we can find outlets that are socially acceptable. But here in a mental hospital, we often have patients who can't live peaceably with other people. Psychopaths, for example, who haven't come to terms with their aggressive tendencies. How can we help patients who are aggressive? Could we give some thought to this problem? Let's see if we can discover what lies behind any incidents in the wards. Equally important, let's try to analyze our own reactions. Our personal relationships with the patients make a great difference to their behavior. We can talk this over when we have our next discussion. The more we can understand both our patients and ourselves, the nearer we are to building, well, a calm and helpful atmosphere in which the patients can get better. A truly therapeutic community. Thank you. We've had a bit of an upset in the ward this morning. That's why I was late. Can I borrow your notes, please? Oh, you'll never be able to read this scribble. Look, I'll copy it out and let you have it this evening. All right. OK. Same time, same place. See you then. Bye. Bye. After I left the lecture, I thought quite a bit about what Dr. Daniel had been saying, trying to relate it to the actions of some of our patients at the villa. There's a chap called Andrew Lewis, for example. He's an aggressive psychopath who's been sent to us by the courts. We find him a difficult customer, not only because of his occasional outbursts of violence, but also because of his insolent manner and his uncanny knack of setting the staff one against the other. Talk about the patient's problems of aggression. Andrew's a past master at making us feel aggressive among ourselves. Henry! Yeah? How do you expect me to carry on my work party and get the shed painted when they tell half the patients they needn't come? But I didn't tell half the patients. Andrew Lewis told me he'd sprained his thumb. So I told him he was to tell you, and if you thought it was bad enough, you'd let him off. He told me you said I've got to let him off. Oh, give me a break, chum. I don't usually interfere. Don't you? This isn't the first time this has happened. Oh, come off it, mate. Surely you two know better than to let Andrew Lewis rattle you like this? Come on, give me a hand with this list for the cricket match tomorrow. All right. Dr. Daniel's lecture gave me food for thought, too. It was the very next day that something happened to precipitate an outburst from Susan Morris. She can be very impulsive at times. Sometimes she starts on an expedition of her own that has some special meaning for her, though it's difficult for us to see what. This time she began to wander down the ward with stiff and awkward movements. She seemed to be on the lookout all the time. At one moment, she had to steady herself on the table. I was wondering whether to try and persuade her to join the others. She doesn't like being interfered with, but she'll only get worse if we allow her to retreat into her fantasies too much. Just then, Mrs. Croft came up to show me her new glasses. To please her, I tried them on and said, pretty powerful lenses, aren't they? Everything looks about twice as clear. Susan turned round and stared at me. Then it happened. Sister and another nurse were on the spot before she could hurt me. It was over almost as quickly as it started. Susan suddenly looked terribly small and lost, as if she had just come back from another world, a frightening world in which she'd been made to do things she didn't really want to do. Sister seemed to know exactly how to reassure her and bring her back to everyday life. As for me, I hadn't been hurt at all, but I admit I was shaken. 
This wasn't the first time Susan had gone for me. Why me? I hadn't even been speaking to her. After lunch, we all turned out to watch a cricket match. Susan was allowed to come too, as she seemed to be back to her usual withdrawn self. The match was one we'd look forward to, patients versus staff. We've got some good players on both sides this year. Andrew Lewis told me how he'd got his blue at Cambridge and played at Lord's. Well, I took that with a grain of salt. But I find there's something rather interesting about this young man. Although I know he doesn't cut much ice with Henry and the other male nurses. I was glad to see Joan at the cricket match. I'm not so pleased to find Andrew making up to her. Beats me what she sees in him. But there you are. Andrew's stock in trade is his charm, which he can lay on with a trowel whenever it suits him. The ward staff and I had some discussion as to whether Andrew Lewis was well enough to play. He can be very violent at times, but this is the sort of calculated risk we feel justified in taking. After all, the hospital is a sort of social laboratory in which patients should be able to test out different ways of behaving. Sometimes they can only learn how to live more normally through trial and error. So we try and create an atmosphere which is as near as possible to life in the outside world, yet sufficiently controlled to be safe for experiments. Andrew had been so quiet for the past few weeks that it was disappointing to see him break out like this. I decided to have him transferred back to his old ward for the time being. A violent outburst of this kind is one of the most disruptive things that can happen in our community. It brings out all sorts of emotions which often take the form of moral judgments. Andrew Lewis again. I knew there'd be trouble. That's what comes with all this freedom. Five to one. What chance does he have? Oh, well, he'll soon settle down in the ward. I phoned the ward from the social centre to find out how Andrew was getting on. The charge nurse told me he was still aggressive and didn't care what he'd done. I ordered a sedative at the discretion of the charge nurse and told him I'd be along when the match was over. Our patients seemed to be a bit jumpy after the episode on the cricket field. Joe Barclay felt he was being haunted again, very restless. Alec Crome started his nervous tick. He hasn't had it for months. I could detect a ripple of tension among the patients at my end of the room, too. I thought Susan was going to become upset. She had a current bun on her plate and began to stare at it. It looked a bit like a face. Suddenly she started gouging the eyes out and giggling. I diverted her attention with some chocolate biscuits, which I know she likes, and managed to get the bun away.
sister said she thought Susan would be all right, at least till we got back to the ward. And she was. I went back to Andrew's ward to see how he was getting on, and was glad to learn that the sedative hadn't been necessary. As Charge Nurse Waters was having a quiet session with him, I didn't interrupt. There had been quite a lot of interest among the staff about the two recent outbursts of aggression, so we arranged a special meeting to see what we could learn by pooling our knowledge and our experience. But Susan gives you absolutely no warning. One minute she was wandering down the ward and the next minute she was at me. And you didn't say anything to her? No. Maybe something was going on in her dream world which made her aggressive and you just happened to be there. Could it be that you disturbed her world in some way? Could there be any connection between the glasses Joan was trying on and eyes in the current bun? Remember the eyes in those paintings of hers? Her paintings show clearly that she wants to escape from an all-seeing eye, which may be a symbol of her feelings of persecution. Somewhere in the picture you may find her, crouching in a safe, protected corner. She often tries to hide away in the ward. I suppose that's part of it. That walk of hers, it looked as if she was wading. Supposing in her dream world, she was trying to find a safe place where no one would see her. Her voices urgently tell her there's danger in being seen. Everyone will know what she's doing. just about to find the safe, secret place she wants when Nurse Baker's voice comes to her from another world, saying, in effect, I can see you very clearly. But we don't know really. We're only imagining. Ah, oh, that's true enough. But don't you think that Imagination is one of the greatest gifts that we can bring to the understanding of our patients. So we've got to be careful with Susan, not to talk about eyes or seeing or watching. It's going to be difficult, isn't it? I mean, by the time you've got yourself sorted out with all of the patients, you might as well take a vow of silence altogether. That would be a terrible sentence for you, my dear. Now, the way I see it is, we can't hope to understand all their delusions, no matter how hard we try. But as long as we realize that it's nothing against us personally, we can keep a calm relationship with our patients. But you're bound to feel it personally. At least I am. It's no use pretending I don't. I think I've got some idea now how this particular incident happened. But you see, she goes for me more than the rest. Why me? Do I get in her way accidentally or, or what? Not necessarily. Would you admit to being a little uncertain of her? Well, yes, I am a bit. I sometimes have to nerve myself to go up to her. Well, do you think that might communicate itself to Susan in some way? How do you mean? Well, now, you've got to remember that she's even more bewildered than you are. She's lost. Maybe she panics when she senses your fears, or maybe she wants to hurt you. But if you can go on helping her, in spite of these outbursts, you must want to help her a great deal. And that's what she desperately needs to know. I think I see. To me, a schizophrenic patient like Susan isn't too difficult to understand. You can make allowances. But when you get a chap like Andrew Lewis, he seems to cause trouble for its own sake. He's crafty. It isn't as if he's psychotic. He knows what he's doing. He may not be psychotic, but he's, well, quite as much a sick person as Susan. Mr. Waters, 
You spent some time with him. Perhaps you could tell us a bit about his history. Yes. I have managed to piece together quite a lot, partly from talking with him and partly from what Dr. Daniel has told me. The main thing that comes out is that even when he was a baby, no one really loved him or wanted him. His father seems to have been a hard, violent man, and his mother a sick woman herself. The father was actively hostile to the baby and his mother completely indifferent. Andrew's early life was made up of unhappy incidents. The mother rejecting the child and the father going for it. When he was about five, the father did a bunk. Mrs. Lewis sank further into apathy. By now, in this unloved little boy, the ability to love had been stifled. From now on, he was growing up with an essential factor missing in his makeup. He would lash out with rage and hatred, especially at anyone in authority. He was destructive, he lied, he stole. He had a deep and bitter grudge against the world in general. When he was 12, he'd been sent to live with foster parents because his mother couldn't cope. They were a very decent couple who wanted to make him a real home. But already it was far too late for Andrew to return their love. On the surface, he could be as nice as pie when it suited him. And then, his resentment would burst out in apparently senseless destructiveness and cruelty. He could no more help these outbursts than a lame man can help limping. Punishment meant nothing to him, and he was incapable of learning from past experience. In time, his foster parents found they could no longer cope with him. So this wretched boy grew up against a shifting background of people trying to help or reform him. Children's homes, child guidance clinics, juvenile courts, the lot. Eventually he is sent to us for treatment. The unhappiness of the child has been driven underground. And on the surface we find the spivvy character who is often so difficult to understand. When the umpire told him to get along off the field, it was authority pushing him around again the same old pattern. He met the situation in the way a small child might, by lashing out. I do believe he's so warped that he's incapable of behaving in any other way when he's frustrated. Well, I know many people think he's a difficult cuss, but I hope I've been able to give you enough information to get him a bit more sympathy. I think we can probably help Andrew best at this point by examining our own feelings towards him. You know, I'm not certain we've got to the bottom of this business. Why do you attack Nurse Ferguson? Why not the umpire, the father figure? How, um, how do you get on with him? Not terribly well, I'm afraid. May I ask you two a personal question? Mm -hmm. I noticed at the match that Andrew was trying to make a hit with Joan. And Joan didn't mind a bit. Would you say there was a bit of rivalry there? Well, I didn't think that... Well, he does rather... It was just a thought. You see, we've got to remember that everything we do, now every single thing may react in some way on our patients. Well, if there's been a bit of rivalry, it would certainly make Andrew's defeat at the cricket match all the more humiliating for him. But I'm not the only person that Andrew plays up. He seems to create bad feeling between us all in the ward. How do you react to that? Well, I'm learning to cope. Slowly, I'm afraid. But why does he get any satisfaction out of it? Divide and rule. That's his policy. Don't you think that uh, because he's at loggerheads with the world in general, he wants us all in the same boat? Unconsciously, of course. But we mustn't let him upset us. That will be fatal. Well, can we turn it round the other way and show Andrew that we want him in our community? We can only do that by making him feel we like him. He'll never alter unless he really cares about what we think of him. Then, bit by bit, we can try and make him aware that his aggressive and antisocial actions are part of his illness. That is possible, even with a psychopath. It's a slow process. Needs infinite patience and friendliness. I think we have to admit we're still groping in the dark in our treatment of this illness. It's a tremendous challenge to all of us. So our discussion continued. 
we were gradually coming to see that relationships in a community such as ours have to be based on acceptance. An understanding that sick or injured patients, with all their fears or aggressions, are people very like ourselves. In this atmosphere of acceptance, their aggressive drives can find new ways of expression, in making things, in useful chores and team activity, and finally, in preparing for a return to a full and normal life. 